Show me what you got up here. Would you mind showing me around some of this stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me show you this stuff. This is good. Take a picture of this. This is the Phantom that I flew. This is VF-84, and this was the model that I flew in the middle here mm -hmm. for three and a half years. The Jolly Rogers, very famous fighter squadron. And this is my most prized possession. This is my diploma from Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun, in 1971. My commanding officer said to me, you know, you get yourself into a frame of mind here. Okay? Will you assume it's dangerous, you might not make it, but you're going to get back. And if you can't get yourself into that frame of mind where you don't care, then you're not going to make it. All right? You have to believe that you're superhuman and you're going to be fine, which is the way I felt anyway. Yeah, Tom McNeil, born in Boston. And I grew up in Cambridge, Mass, in a three-decker just outside Harvard Square. And uh, we moved to Boston when I was 13 years old. I went to Boston Latin, went to Boston College. Uh, was a math major at BC and really didn't have much of an idea about what I wanted to do next in my life, but I thought that the military would be a good option. So I applied to the Marine Corps uh, platoon leaders program, but I decided not to take advantage of that. Okay. And uh, then I went and uh, took the test for Naval Air at South Weymouth Naval Air Station. So the only flight I had ever had in my life before I flew to Pensacola for OCS was my uh, was a flight to New York for St. Patrick's Day weekend on Northeast Airlines. It was nineteen dollars to fly down there, and uh, I got a ride back in a car. But that's the only flight I had ever had in, in my life. Still the best weekend I've ever had, by the way. <laughs> but but let me tell you why what made me decide. I I drove a school bus in the summers drove these kids to day camp, and there were five bus drivers, all college kids. I was a junior in college at that time, and wondering what I was going to do with my future, you know, because mm -hmm. I thought I liked the military, but I wasn't sure. So one of the bus drivers uh, was a student at Boston University, and he was in Navy ROTC. And we were laying on the beach one day at this day camp because we'd just drive the school bus, drop the kids off, and then lay on the beach all day. Best job I've ever had, by the way. <laughs> but he said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, one of my instructors was a phantom pilot in the Navy. I said, really? I said, what's that all about? He said, well, you know, these phantoms, they fly at Mach 2.2, which is about 1,600 miles an hour. And then they come back to the ship to land. And you come down on the glide slope, you know, at about 150 knots. And the deck is pitching and moving. And when you hit the deck, you have to push the power up to full power in case you miss the wires. And if you miss the wires, you got enough power to go around and try it again. And if you catch the wires, you stop in about 120 feet. And that was the story he told. It was at that moment that I said to myself, you know, I think I'd like to try that. That's when I made the decision. And uh, the next fall, I went through the acceptance program, the, the testing and the physical for Naval Air. And I was accepted. And... Uh, it was a great day for me. It changed my whole life. But uh, what did it feel like when you were accepted? Well, it was very exciting. You know, there were five. There were five of us going through the physical on the same day. And I knew I had great eyes. But you know, the last thing they do is test test your eyes. They they dilate your pupils and they look inside your eyeball to be sure you don't have any in, inner problems in the eyes. 
So I went through that test and I passed just fine. I had 2015 vision. But two of the guys who were with me, I didn't know anybody, any of the other guys, but two of them had been in the Civil Air Patrol and they had flown through high school and college, you know, light planes. And you could, you could tell by the way they were talking, uh, flying in the Navy, that that was their dream. That was the ultimate for them. And they both failed the eye test. And one of them came out of the testing room with tears in his eyes. It was so bad. He was so devastated. And then I realized how special and how, how special it was, how lucky I was to have passed everything. So that was 1966. Okay. I graduated from college. So I went through that testing in the spring of 1966. Mm -hmm. And when I was accepted, I decided I could have started uh, Naval Air uh, Officer Candidate School in, in the summer, in June or July. But I thought, gee, this is my last summer to have a good time. So I delayed my entry date until September. And I had a great summer and then flew down. My second flight ever in an airplane mm -hmm. was to Pensacola to start OCS. And at this point, I mean... There were troops in Vietnam. Yes. Uh, did you know that you were going to go likely take part in Vietnam? Yeah, yeah, we, we all pretty much knew that. One of my friends who you'll get to interview was already in Vietnam in 1966 in, uh, in the DMZ. He was fighting up in the DMZ. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we had a sense that we might have to go fly in combat at that point. And... Uh, but it was kind of exciting to think about that stuff. You, know? you had a dad who was in World War II. I, I know a lot of the generation that fought in Vietnam sort of grew up idolizing the World War II vets. Oh, yeah. Did that play a part in your decision to go? Yeah. I, you know, my father used to tell stories about what he went through in Europe. He was in Czechoslovakia during the war. And uh, he had some very uh, hairy experiences in combat, you know, that where he could have been killed. So he used to tell us his stories. So my older brother and I both had kind of committed that we were going to go into the service. Maybe you had, when I got out of college, the draft was still on. So we were going to go either voluntarily or Uncle Sam would come after us. So I wanted to go voluntarily. And, uh, and I thought flying would be the most exciting way to go. But tell me about flight school. Well, flight school was great. Best experience that I have ever gone through. So uh, we started with OCS, where they start to train you. And the first week of OCS, it's 13 weeks total time in OCS. But the first week is called, you go to indoctrination battalion. And it's aptly named because the first person you meet is a Marine drill instructor. And, you know, we had all come through the summer. We're all college kids. We're having a great time on Cape Cod or, or out in California. And we show up at Indoctrination Battalion. And as you're walking up to the front door, you can hear the screaming from the Marine drill instructors bracing people against the wall, demanding that they salute. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> so the way they woke us up, they had a record, a 78 record of the national anthem. And then they had another one of Reveille. Have you ever heard Reveille? Mm -hmm. And they had it in the barracks we were in. And was, they put the needle on the record, and you'd hear through the PA system before it started to play. So normally, the first couple of days you woke up once the music started. Mm -hmm. It was very loud. But after that, as soon as they put the needle on the record and you could hear the little hissing, everybody was up and out of bed. You didn't even have to hear the, you didn't have to hear the music. And you'd get out of bed and you'd be standing at attention next to your bunk. So it was very, very high level training and discipline and attention to detail. It was, it was wonderful. But that was for a week. And then we went to our battalions where we had 35 people in my class and there were three battalions of every week they'd bring, bring 35 new candidates in. 
So we had 35 people. We were all like brothers. We lived four to a room. We would have uh, educational training every day. We'd have physical fitness. We'd have uh, military training. Those were the three areas that we trained in. We'd have inspections uh, in our rooms where you'd have to fix your bed. We just had sheets on the bed, no blankets, because it was summertime. And this, the drill instructor would come in and he'd take a nickel and, and he would bounce it off the sheet on your bed. And if that nickel didn't bounce, it meant your sheets weren't on tight enough and you'd get a demerit for that. So everything, the, the shirts and the socks and the underwear, everything had to be folded perfectly laid on the bed, and if you folded your underwear eight inches wide instead of seven inches wide, you got a demerit. Socks had to be laid out. And they, they emphasized attention to detail, mm -hmm. which I've tried to emphasize with my children. I'm not sure they listen to me. I think Emily might listen to me. But, but, uh, uh, but we knew why, after we get into airplanes, why they did that. Because if you don't pay attention to detail and you miss something on the checklist, you could, could have an accident or kill yourself. So that was, that was uh, highly emphasized. But it was wonderful. It was just a, a wonderful experience. And we got commissioned after 13 weeks, so we, got to be, we became officers. Then we went to uh, flight prep, which is where you go through about six weeks of training in things like aerodynamics, navigation, leadership, uh, everything to do with flight and uh, becoming an officer, which was very, that's where we joined, uh, we were joined by other people from the Naval Academy or people who went through Navy, Navy ROTC because they were already commissioned, they didn't have to go through OCS. So they mixed us all together in flight prep. So we had a, uh, it's a very competitive group and uh, there were three areas, uh, military, physical fitness, and uh, academic that you had to qualify in or that you had to achieve in. And they assigned points for everything you did in those three areas. And there was great competition to fly jets. So everybody was striving to get as many points as they possibly could so they could have their choice of either flying jets or they might have to go to propeller planes, which were number two. Like we consider them second class citizens, although they were, good, they were very good guys. Or helicopters. So the, the jets were the, pre, the premium objective. Uh, the middle of the road guys got props and the lower graded people got uh, helicopters. So I was, I think, uh, out of 70 people, I think I ranked second or third because I was working at it, you know, and uh, somewhere in the top five. Uh, and uh, so I got to go to the jet pipeline. And when I when I started flying, uh, initially we flew in small propeller planes. So I had the second highest grades there. So I got my choice of airplanes. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I, I realized I had a knack for flying. I just, I, I like to drive cars, so I had a knack for flying. So I selected, uh, I was thinking about flying jets, and then I thought I might want to fly propeller planes too, you know, P3 propeller planes, which was not a very exciting mission, but I wasn't really sure that I wanted to fly jets. I thought I did. And then I had another uh, aha moment they had a couple of guys come to speak to us at our basic flight training school. Mm -hmm. And these guys had just come back from Vietnam. And they flew fighters, F-8 Crusaders. And they had a, had a combat tour in, in Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin. And, and uh, then they had a fire on the ship on the way back from Vietnam. And they lost a lot of their friends in this fire on the aircraft carrier. So they came to speak to the students at Softly Field, you know, our basic training field. And they get up, I get goosebumps telling the story, but they started talking about their experience in combat and how exciting it was and how they had 
shot down a couple of MiGs, and one of their guys was shot down, and then they lost a lot of their friends in the fire on the Ariskany. And I'm thinking, geez, you know, I get it. That's the, that's the route I have to go. And then they went down to their airplanes, and they taxied down to the end of the runway. And these jets, fighter jets, are very loud. So two of them took off in formation, and they cruised down the runway, and they pulled up and went straight up, right over the, right over the group of us that were standing there, and went out of sight going straight up. I said, yeah. I'm going jets. <laughs> that's my decision. That was the day I decided. So that's how it happens, you know. And then so I, I get into the jet pipeline and I went through basic jet training and then advanced jet training. I went through Meridian, Mississippi and basic jets and Beeville, Texas, flying the, uh, the F-9 Cougar. And I got my wings uh, from uh, Corpus Christi in 1968, March of 1968. Because I had very good grades in flying, I got to choose the kind of airplane I wanted to fly. So the hottest airplane in those days, the most sophisticated and high-performance airplane in, in that era was the Phantom, the F-4 Phantom. So I pick phantoms, and I pick the West Coast. The phantoms are based on the East Coast and the West Coast, either Miramar, where the Top Gun School was, or Virginia Beach, NAS Oceana. So I picked the West Coast, because that's where the action was. And a friend of mine, another friend of mine, picked the East Coast. But when the orders came in, he had the West Coast, and I had the East Coast. I said, how did that happen? They just switched the, you know, they just juggled the orders. So I ended up going to uh, the Naval Air Station at Oceana, and he went to Miramar. Mike Jonas was his name. And I met him up several years later, and he was married, and he had his wife. They were at the officers' club. And I, I met his wife, and I said, you know, you're supposed to be my wife, because <laughs> he got my orders to go to the West Coast. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> So I flew out of Naval Air Station. You want to hear more about this? Tell me, tell me about the first time. Like, what did it feel like the first time you're in, a, you're in a jet? Well, it's a great experience. But I'll tell you about my first time in a Phantom. Because these jets we flew in training were not that powerful. You know, they, were, they were a little more powerful than, than uh, propeller planes. But when I got into a Phantom Squadron... These are high-performance airplanes. The planes weighed about 35,000 pounds, and the thrust in the engines was a total of about 36,000 pounds. So it was a very high, highly-powered airplane. So my first flight in a Phantom was in Key West, where you start basic training in the Phantom. So you're very excited when you're doing this, right? So I get into the front seat of the Phantom, and my instructor got in the back seat, and it's very exciting. I started the airplane up, and I get out in the runway, and I said, I want to see what this baby can do, you know, because the guy in the back didn't have any instruments. So, so I took off full afterburner. You're supposed to pull it out of afterburner after you get off the ground and raise the gear. So I took off, and I left it in afterburner, and I put the gear handle up, and I get up way over the speed I should be at. And I could hear the fellow in the back seat yelling at me. And I couldn't hear what he was saying. Then I heard what he said. He said, the gear didn't come up. The, you got to slow down, let the wheels come up. So it was a little bit embarrassing. But I slowed down and uh, the gear came up and we had a great flight. Very exciting though. You know, it's like the, the biggest difference between men and boys is the cost of their toys. All right. But that was, those were very heady days back in uh, 1968 and 69. It was just, I felt very fortunate, as we all did. But, you know, it was a bunch of crazy people. We had great times, great parties, great, a lot of fun. And we got into some very exciting flying activity and training. So, yeah. Any, any memorable incidents in training? Any, any stories from... from well... You know, we had uh, we used to have to go out to the aircraft carrier 
And uh, on one of our flights uh, in advanced jet training, one of my buddies came down the glide slope and landed and didn't catch the wires and went right off the deck into the water. Now he ejected, because we have ejection seats, you know, could pull a handle between your legs and you'll shoot up 300 feet. So uh, he didn't make it, you know, he, he, he uh, the hook missed the wires and he went into the water and they rescued him, they picked him up and uh, that's a big mistake on his part. But they said, what happened? He said, well, I bolted, you know, I missed the wires and I pushed the power up and nothing happened. Now, that doesn't make much sense. But what are they going to do? Go down and fish the plane out of two miles deep ocean water? So they, he said, I pushed the power up, nothing happened. So that was, that was an interesting incident. And uh, when I, uh, one of our guys, we had several people killed in flight training. Not several, but we had three or four guys who got, uh, had accidents and get killed. It's kind of sad. But it was, it was kind of, uh, it wasn't dangerous, but it could be if you get into a bad situation in a plane and didn't get out fast, you know, eject or pull out. So we had, I think, three people who were killed in flight, flight training and, and accidents. Did that affect you at all? Did no, not really. You know, most of us were thinking, yeah, I suppose it could, something could happen to us, but we always thought it was going to happen to the other guy. That's the only way to survive. You just assume you're going to make it. So, tell me about kind of getting your orders to go over to Vietnam. Well, I was a Navy pilot, and I extended my tour in the Navy beyond my five years. So, I got orders to the Air Force. They send pilots, they swap pilots between services. So I got exchange duty with the Air Force because they flew the same airplanes. They had Phantoms in the Air Force too. So I got to go to uh, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina to fly with the Air Force. And it was kind of a, uh, uh, a very desirable tour of duty. A lot of people wanted to do it. And I didn't realize how great it was until I got there. You know, it was really fabulous. So you fly with the Air Force guys. Now, they couldn't land on ships. And they really weren't highly trained in dogfighting and air combat because they were bombers at this base. They dropped bombs. But so I went to Seymour Johnson and became uh, the bud a buddy of a lot of these Air Force guys. So that was in 1971, November of 1971, I went to the Air Force. And we were in peace talks with the North Vietnamese in that era. The peace talks extended for months and months. In fact, maybe two years. But in any event, in March of 1972, uh, Henry Kissinger was our emissary for the peace talks. And Richard Nixon was the president. And the peace talks broke down in March of 1972. So we hadn't done any bombing in North Vietnam for four years. They had stopped bombing north of the demilitarized zone and uh, to try to settle the war and arrive at a compromise. But the North Vietnamese would not budge on any of these issues. So Henry Kissinger walked out of the peace talks in March of 72. And Richard Nixon said, okay, we're going to start bombing North Vietnam again. So our base in North Carolina was the number one contingency base in the Air Force. In other words, if something happened around the world where we had to get into combat, our base was the first base to go. So there were uh, 36 Phantoms in the air within three days joining a tanker to head from North Carolina. The first stop was Hawaii, then Guam, then the Philippines, and then into Thailand to start bombing North Vietnam again. So they had had four years in North Vietnam to build up their supply of MiGs and 
SAM surface to air missiles and AAA. So the first, I think the first missions, the first weekend of missions into North Vietnam, they fired more SAMs at our airplanes than had been fired for the previous, for the whole war, because right. they had so many SAMs up there. So we started flying missions into Hanoi. Uh, and Hanoi was, uh, and is to, even today, the most heavily defended target in the history of warfare. They had more uh, defense, defensive weapons, and, and uh, it, was just, it was just a maelstrom of, of uh, weaponry they had up there, because they had all this time to build it up. So we had to fly in, because Nixon wanted to make an impression on the North Vietnamese that if they didn't want to acquiesce, we were going to make them. They're very tough people, those North Vietnamese, by the way. So we flew missions. Most of my missions were into North Vietnam. I had 79 missions. But uh, when they needed pilots, they needed two volunteers to go on that first mission. Uh, there were three of us in our squadron who volunteered, me and two other guys. No one else volunteered. So we got, we got to go early. And, uh, but I was very excited about that because I had many friends who had been in Vietnam, not as pilots, but on the ground. So I thought it would be a, a great experience for me to go. So I was very excited to go. And I had all the training I needed. I, had, I knew more about dogfighting and air combat than anybody in the Air Force because I had been through top gun school. So I, was, I, was, I, I felt very confident in that regard. So you almost feel like, okay, now I get to test. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a great challenge. It was a wonderful opportunity for me. And I was very confident, you know, because I knew what kind of weapon systems we had, and I knew the deficiencies of the uh, weapon systems that the uh, North Vietnamese had, because we had studied that stuff. So. so did your mindset sort of change at all now that it became real? Yeah, I'll tell you a great story. Do you like these stories? Okay, of course. So I had not been to jungle school with the Air Force. You know, I, had been with the, I hadn't been to jungle school, but all the other pilots in the Air Force had. So when I went to Thailand, we flew missions out of Thailand into North Vietnam, I had a stop at jungle school in the Philippines. And that was a week of training. You know, in case you get shot down, You'd know what to do to live off the land and you know avoid getting bit by a, a jungle rat, which were they were about this big. And uh, so I went through jungle school. So I flew into Thailand a week after my squadron, the rest of the squadron and airplanes had gotten there. So I came in in a transport plane. And the night before I came in, I was at the officers' club at Clark Air Force Base. And I met a couple of young guys who were coming back from Vietnam who had been there uh, for about six months. And we were sitting having drinks at the officers club. And this one young guy was telling me, he said, oh yeah, we flew all kinds of missions in the Hanoi. He said, I was the wingman for my squadron commander. In other words, he's flying here and the squadron commander is in front of him. And we were over Hanoi and a SAM came up and hit my leader right in the belly of the airplane and killed him. Plane exploded. And I'm sitting there, having had no combat experience at all, and I'm sitting there listening, because I'm on the way over. And I'm sitting there listening to these stories. that you've got to be kidding. He said, no. He was there one minute and gone the next. This guy was only like 24 years old. So we had a lot of drinks. So I, was a, I, was a little, I wasn't feeling that great when I got off the plane in Thailand. But when I got off the plane in Thailand, uh, my squadron had been there for a week and they were flying missions into Hanoi. So they would fly with about 24 Phantoms and the Phantoms would fly in flights of four. You know, there are four airplanes and then four airplanes and you'd have, you'd have six flights of four. So I got off the airplane and the squadron commander came to meet me. And we were standing there on the, on the ramp, and there was a, a, a strike flight coming back from Hanoi. 
So, I mean, I had been a peacetime flyer. Never been shot at, right? So the planes were coming in. There were four planes. And there were four more planes. And then there were three planes. And the squadron commander looked at, looked at me. We looked up. He looked at me. He said, MiGs. I said, oh, my God, this is the real thing. One of those guys had been shot down. We had eight guys shot down when I was there. That's when I realized this is for real. And then I just started flying missions the next day. My first combat mission was into South Vietnam. And I had no idea what to expect, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're very excited. I mean, you're really, you know, hyped. But it was pretty simple, really. There was no uh, really... uh, enemy defenses on the mission. I mean, we just went in, we had a couple of bombing targets. But those were the easy missions. Then we started going into North Vietnam where, where it was like night and day. But uh, yeah, that was the revelation. That was the most exciting thing that anybody said to me uh, up until that time in flying, the word MiGs. Because <laughs> you knew it was for real. So did you have sort of a, I mean, what is your routine before you go on one of these missions? That's a very good question, yeah. Well, the first thing you do, uh, you know, we had an officer's club. We all met at the officer's club at night. We'd have dinner and then drink, have a couple of beers, play pool. And you go back to your hooch, you know, with your room. We always had three people in a room. You get up at about 4 o'clock in the morning. You, uh, you know, you're flying about 24 phantoms into North Vietnam. And you'd have a briefing in a briefing room. And they would, they would pull back the curtains and there would be a screen that had, we call, uh, Hanoi was, uh, uh, the call sign for Hanoi was bullseye, right? Which is what it was for us. And uh, they would have r- rings that would be a radius of about 15 miles. And those were SAM rings. So that would be the range of a surface-to-air missile site. And they had about 50 of these SAM rings on this map all around Hanoi. And the most fearsome things for us was to be, have a SAM fired at us because it's tough to dodge a SAM. So you'd look at these rings and you'd say, "Eh, (laughs) that doesn't look too good, right? (laughs) So it was a little terrifying in in an exciting sort of way. And they would give us a briefing at four. We'd leave the briefing room at about quarter or five, get in the van, go out to uh, the trailer to pick up our guns. You know, we all carried 38s. So they give you a gun, you check it out, and they give you the ammunition to put into it, and you'd have to load the gun on the way out to the airplane, right? And we had a holster. You can see it in that book. And I never, I had never fired a gun. I didn't know anything about a gun. So every time I pulled out my gun and started putting bullets in, everybody would duck. They'd say, look out, McNeil's putting bullets in his gun again. So they used to tell us, if you eject over enemy territory, as you're coming down on the parachute, take out the gun and throw it away so you don't hurt yourself. (laughs) And they meant it, by the way. But then we get into the airplanes. We'd start up. And... uh, we taxi out to the runway, and uh, my first mission to Hanoi, which was you know pretty pretty intense. I said to my guy in the back seat as we're sitting on the runway with the engines run up, we're about to take off. I said to him, "Rip, Rip Darden was his name." I said, "Rip, I think they're serious about this. They really want us to go." <laughs> he said, "Yeah, we're going." So we line up with eight Phantoms on the runway. Four of them would be a thousand feet down. We'd be behind them, and then we would launch off uh, two groups of four. Just fearsome, bristling, bristling with weaponry. We we would carry sixteen five hundred pound bombs. Sometimes we'd carry eight two thousand pound bombs, and we would take off on the mission. And it was about a, maybe an hour and a half to get to Hanoi. So we would have to join on a tanker. So we'd have four, four phantoms on each tanker. So they'd have like six tankers, uh, KC-135s. 
And we would fly on that tanker until we got to, to the border of Laos because the, the, the tankers could not go across the Laotian border because they might get shot down with a SAM. So we would fly on the wing of this tanker and we would just continually refuel. You know, we just we'd just keep topping off the fuel tank. So it was like a ballet. One plane would go in, the next plane would come in, you'd go. And when we get to the Laotian border, because we know we're going into uh, this target area, the tanker would turn, right? The tanker would gradually turn away, right? And then we were on our own going in, and you, the adrenaline rush would start. And the excitement level, we would be in a, a high threat area, target area around Hanoi for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, with all those SAM rings. We get attacked by MiGs on almost every mission. They would come up behind us, and and uh, we had a ship in the Gulf of Tonkin, a Navy ship, that would call us, and they had a radio so powerful. If we were talking on the radio, and we talked very little because you didn't want to be chattering on the radio, but if we were talking, their uh, radio broadcast was so powerful would burn through all of our communications. And they would call us initially, they would say, uh, the, the, the MiGs were red, white, and blue bandits. So the red bandits were MiG-17s, uh, white were MiG-19s, but the blue bandits were MiG-21s. Those are the most fearsome, hyper, supersonic jets. So we would get a call from Red Crown in the Gulf of Tonkin, and they would say to us, uh, strike flight, Blue Bandits taxiing, okay? I get, I get goosebumps telling you this story, by the way. So we knew Blue Bandits would make 21s. They were taxiing on their runway at one of the North v Vietnamese airfields to take off to attack us. And then they would call again. Strike flight, you have Blue Bandits airborne. They knew all the stuff. They had people on the ground telling them what was, they had spies in North Vietnam. Then they would call these bandits as they would circle around behind us so they'd say, you know, we had to go to the target. We couldn't deviate. They would call us and say, Blue Bandits, uh, 1 o'clock, 2 miles, Mach 1.2. They would say, Blue Bandits, 4 o'clock, Mach 1.5. And when they got behind us, when they said, Blue Bandits, 6 o'clock, Mach 1.6, when they said they were at a mile and a half, we knew they could fire at us. So we had to take some evasive maneuvers so we didn't get shot down. So... Uh, we knew, we knew what to do, but you know, they wanted, the, the, the North Vietnamese pilots wanted to disrupt our mission so we could not get to the target, right. so. So, I mean, I can't imagine what, I mean, you guys take off your information. Yeah. You can feel the weight of the power of all the weaponry. That you're oh yeah, you feel like you are King Kong with that sort of weaponry, okay? Now here's what we carried. Because the Fanta was very powerful. We would carry 16 500 pound bombs or maybe eight 2,000 pound bombs. You know, big, big, these are big bombs, right? We would have two Sidewinder missiles, we'd have two Sparrow missiles, and we would have a gun, this Gatling gun in the nose. So we were bristling with weaponry, all right? Now, we weren't there to shoot down other airplanes. Uh, we had uh, combat air patrol airplanes flying above us, behind us, protecting us, because we were the bombers. We had to get to the target. Mm -hmm. But one of our guys shot down a MiG one day. The MiG came from behind and pulled up in front, and he actually shot him down with a Sparrow missile. But the weaponry was overwhelming, yeah. okay? And, and, but there were, the MiGs were overwhelming uh, opponents as well. But there... Their advantage was that they were coming up behind us at very high speed, and they were very hard to see. And so we were defend. We were very defensive. But you know, we I I was very confident. I mean, you know, I because I knew the tactics, and you always assume it's going to be the other guy that gets shot down. So uh, we got attacked. Uh, there were two times that I was uh, under attack on one mission, and one time on a mission the next day. Uh, but we ju I just evaded the missiles that were fired, which wasn't that difficult, as long as I knew they were there. But the adrenaline rush was overwhelming on these missions, right? The excitement level 
was beyond anything a normal person would experience because you have all your emotions working at once. I mean, everything, you're hyper. No problem staying awake, okay? And we had equipment in our airplanes, uh, electronic countermeasures equipment that would actually, uh, a strobe would point. If a SAM site locked on to an airplane, the strobe would point at the SAM site so you knew where to look and you'd hear a warbling sound in your earphone when they locked the radar onto your airplane and then it was very high pitched when they fired the missile. Well, there were so many strobes and so many warbling noises because there were so many SAM sites, we just turned off the equipment because <laughs> it was too distracting. That's all you heard was noise. But you had to see, if you, if you had a SAM fired, you had to see it coming uh, in order to evade it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you just, your head's on a swivel. You're looking around. I gotta ask, what is the procedure for dodging a SAM? That's a very interesting question. Well, they were, fi they were firing uh, SAM-2s, SA-2s at us, which were not as sophisticated as the later models. But if you didn't see a SAM coming, it would hit you. It would hit the airplane. And a SAM was like a telephone pole. But as long as a telephone pole, and it would fly at probably Mach 3, about 2,000 miles an hour. But the objective was to see the SAM. Because if you didn't see it, you were in trouble. So you'd have the strobes. I told you about the strobes on the gear. You know, if you had that on, you would know what direction it was coming from. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of SAMs fired at us because the MiGs were chasing us. And they didn't want to fire a SAM and maybe hit one of their own airplanes. But the procedure was, you know, this, the Phantom was a high-G maneuvering airplane. So you could pull as much as 7 or 8 Gs with a Phantom. Uh, and you could go negative G, two neg negative Gs, where you'd r f rise up in the seat, right? Uh, so the procedure, if you saw a SAM coming, you'd have to wait, all right? Let's say a SAM is coming up from 2 o'clock, right? You're flying along. You'd have to wait until it got within about a half mile, which is pretty close. I mean, that's very close. You push the stick over, negative G, right? And then you pull back about 6 Gs. So the SAM would follow the negative G. It was radar guided. It would dip. And then when you pulled the 6 Gs, the SAM couldn't recover to come up and hit you. At least you didn't think it would. But you had to see the missile coming to do that. So... And the hard part was waiting until it got to within a half mile. Because if you maneuvered too soon, the SAM would correct and might hit you. So it was a negative G and then a rapid application once the missile started to uh, deviate from the path. But uh, uh, we only had one guy who was injured by a SAM uh, where he had a, uh, a SAM explode outside his cockpit and it came through the glass, and he had glass on his flight suit when he came back. He had pieces of the canopy on his flight suit, and there were shards of uh, explosive material out of the SAM in his cockpit. But he didn't get hurt, thank God. But he said, hey, look, I got glass all over my flight suit yeah. here, so it's a little dicey. But uh, How do you deal with the MiGs? Well, the MiGs... Uh, see, I had been through uh, Top Gun training in the Navy, so I knew all the characteristics of, of MiGs, what their capabilities were, what the weapon systems could do. So, uh, but we had to get to the target, so they would fly MiGs up behind us to attack us. And the MiGs f fired uh, heat-seeking missiles. They were called the Atoll, okay? They were copies of missiles we had. But they weren't very capable. So if you applied G to the airplane, if that missile was coming at you, at your tailpipe, and you pulled two or three Gs, the, the missile couldn't track, okay? The people we had shot down were shot down by uh, atolls, by heat-seeking missiles, but they didn't see them coming. They didn't know they were behind them. So they were in a maneuver where the missile could track. But uh, if you knew someone was in firing range within a mile and a half behind you, you could maneuver and pull 
we could pull six or seven G's if we had to, and the missile wouldn't track, okay? But you had to know that there were missiles in the air in order to evade them. But uh, so they, they weren't very capable. Now, the missiles we had, it wouldn't matter how many G's the opponent, opponent's airplane would pull. If they pulled six G's, they would still get hit because our missiles were so much better, which is still the case now, even flying against Russian airplanes. Our weapon systems are so much more sophisticated than theirs. It wouldn't be much of a contest, really. But, uh, but if you didn't see them coming, that's how they shot most people down. And what, is the, what is the radio chatter like? Is everybody on the same frequency? You have everybody on the same frequency when you're in a combat uh, theater because you have to talk to each other. Right. And... Uh, because when you have when you have dogfighting going on and 30 or 40 airplanes in the air at once you have to be very detailed and understand where your uh, wingmen are uh, where the enemy airplanes were you had a call if someone was being attacked or about to be attacked you had to call them and say hey listen uh, you know, pine two, you got to make it six o'clock, you got to make it five o'clock, break hard left. It's just like you're here in Top Gun. It's all the same stuff. Uh, I'm rolling in, you know, pull, pull, pull hard left, pull hard right, pull up. So, your, so there's a lot of chatter on the radio. So you'd kind of give your wingman advice on which way to. Yeah, that's, that's the way it's, it's called mutual support. We had formations. It was called a loose deuce formation in the Navy. We'd have two planes, and you'd be protecting right. each other yeah. and maneuvering. But the call, the radio chatter was very important because you could, if your wingman didn't see the opposing aircraft, you had to call him to tell him how to maneuver, and he would do the same for you. But uh, so we had pretty sophisticated tactics to defeat MiGs. They really they really weren't much of a threat if you could see them. But the problem is they were so small. If a MiG were at six o'clock, you know, behind you at a mile and a half, the size of the cross section of the MiG would be the size of a ballpoint pen tip mm. from here to where you are. You could see a ballpoint pen tip and that's very hard to see. That's why pilots have to have good eyes. Because if you don't see one, you're in trouble because they can shoot at you and it's tough to see. the missile is even smaller so uh, but we had very good radar coverage in North Vietnam from the Gulf of Tonkin so we, we always knew where the MiGs were so were, were, but you weren't trying were you trying to I guess you were staying in formation right? you weren't trying to maneuver to get behind them very much no the the, the combat air patrol was right. doing that we, we maneuvered to avoid being shot down. But our mission was to get to the target. So we, our job was not to shoot down mix. I mean, we had this one guy shoot one down, but the guy just flew in front of him, so he pulled the trigger. He was the luckiest guy there. But we would have to evade. In this one day, I got a decoration for this one day because I called the lead to make a turn. But we were going around and around with these MiGs, and then one of the cap shot down the MiG that was chasing us, and I saw the thing going down, and the guy ejected. It was very exciting. But we, we had to resume our flight to get back on track to get to the target, which we did. But uh, so these, these MiG pilots were pretty gutsy guys. You know, they'd come up with four or eight MiGs against, you know, 30 or 40 Phantoms. Now, we were on the defensive, trying to evade them. But uh, they, they ran a, a real risk of getting killed or shot down on those missions. So, you know, they were, they were, uh, they were tough opponents, tough to, tough to fight against guys like that. I remember the first guy that was shot down was coming off a target, and uh, his wingman didn't see the MiG coming up because they came up from very low and came up and attacked him just as he was pulling off the target. His name was Keith Lewis. He was our weapons officer. So when he had shot down, I became the weapons officer. I was his assistant. So he opened up a new opportunity for me. But, uh, but he came back. He was in good shape when he came back, he and his backseater. So basically, you take off, 
your information. You got, you said about an hour and a half. To get there. To get there. Yeah. Are you, I mean, are you, is there anything you're doing to psych yourself up? or put yourself in the right headspace? No, you, no, no, you know, you see, it's just natural to get psyched up when you go into combat, you know, and, uh, but the action doesn't really begin. I mean, you get a little, you get the anticipation of getting there, but you know when you cross the Red River, here's my red, my River Rats plaque is up here, the Red River, the Red River was the border of North Vietnam, between Laos and North Vietnam. So you knew when you crossed the Red River, you were into the high threat area, and the action would start. You could hear the, the uh, radio calls getting more intense, because the MiGs would come up, you'd have SAMs being fired. So you just naturally got yourself up to a very high level of energy and excitement when you get into that environment, and you, you know, we had to we had to get the bombs to the target. Uh, you didn't mess around in the target area. You, you'd you'd roll in at about 500 knots, drop the bombs, and get out as quickly as we could. Uh, but there would be 30 or 40 phantoms in the air. There'd be 10 to 15 or 20 MIGs in the air. We call that a fur ball. With planes going crazy all over the place, people talking on the radio, screaming. So everybody's very excited. And on one of these missions, we're in the middle of one of these crazy maelstroms, all these planes, MiGs going up, missiles firing off. And one of the guys came up on the radio and he said, uh, would anybody like a Dr. Pepper? I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> But so we would be in the target area for, you know, 20 minutes in the high threat area and come off target and go back to a tanker. But we carried uh, pint bottles of water in our G-suits. We had pockets in the G-suits, so we'd have a, a bottle of water in each pocket. And when you came off target, on the way back to the tanker, you would drink both bottles of water. And you wouldn't be sweating. But it was the adrenaline rush that was burning up all the moisture in your system because it was so intense. So we drink, drink the water and say, okay, yeah. But it made you very thirsty to be in that kind of environment. So, and then we go back to the tanker, refuel, and go back to the base, and go back to the officers' club and play pool and have drinks and watch a Thai boxing match and then get up the next morning and go do it again. Is there a point... You cross back over that Red River that you start to relax. A bit. Yeah, yeah, that that was very relaxing to get beyond, to get out of the target area, and have nobody shot down. If we were lucky, you know, we had several guys shot down. They all became POWs. Eight eight guys became POWs. We did, we we didn't know that. We didn't know whether we were dead or alive. But uh, yeah, they were all shot down by mix. So. So. Maybe you could just go into detail about some of the missions that you actually flew, like, you know, any, any specific ones that... Yeah, yeah, we flew uh, one mission into Hanoi where we get attacked by MiGs. Uh, and I was, there were eight planes lying abreast, you know, flying like this. We were dropping chaff. Chaff is, is uh, metal particles that you drop out of... Uh, specially designed uh, bomb shells to defeat the enemy's radar mm -hmm. so that the planes coming in behind us uh, to drop the bombs would be protected from SAMs. They couldn't fire at them. So we would fly in line abreast, you know, planes a thousand feet apart, straight across. But we had uh, a bunch of MiGs come after us, and I was number eight. I was out on the right-hand side. They always put the Navy guy out on the right-hand side like, a, like uh, I was bait for these guys. So they were coming after us, and uh, I called the leader because he didn't hear one of the call signs. So I called him. I said, listen, you better do something because they're going to be in firing range pretty soon. So we broke to the left, and they fired some, Sam's at, some uh, uh, heat seeking missiles at us, and they missed everybody. And then we get into one of these dogfights, and one of the one of the planes behind me shot down the plane was that was coming after me. And then they fired a couple of other 
missiles at us, but nobody got hit on that mission, but it was very, you know, and then we resumed our flight into the target, but it was dicey, you know, it was, it was pretty close. Uh, so that was one mission. Then another bombing mission I was on, which was the most dangerous thing that happened to me, uh, we rolled in on a target. It was a barracks complex. You know, we were trying to uh, destroy the places that they slept at night so they wouldn't have a place to sleep. And I rolled in on a target, and the, and the, the briefing was, if you, if you rolled in on a target and you weren't able to drop your bombs accurately, you could come back again and, and make another run. So I rolled in, and one of the other guys ahead of me decided to come back because he missed. And just as I was about to push the button to drop my bombs, I saw this camouflage airplane go in front of me. I didn't miss him by more than 10 feet. I mean, it was almost a mid-air collision. I didn't know he was coming. And the, the news report would have been two phantoms shot down over Hanoi. And it would have been nothing more than a mid-air collision between two people that did the wrong thing. So, yeah, that got, me, that got my attention. That, that uh, again, no problem staying awake in those situations. But What do you mean when you say roll in to the target? Does that mean you're kind of you're in formation and then you... Yeah, you're in formation. You know, you're flying with four planes in a flight. And uh, the leader would roll in first, right? And then the second guy, third and fourth, and you roll in and you, you go down the same bombing trajectory and try to hit the target that we studied on the map before we left the base. So, so it, was all, it was all very detailed and very all planned ahead of time. But you had to have a leader that could find the target too, which is not always that easy. So, uh, but we did pretty good stuff. We got the, the squadron got commendations for doing good work on those missions, and uh, but we, you know, we bombed uh, railroad facilities and oil facilities and barracks. We really weren't going after uh, people, you know. I mean, they claimed that there were a lot of well, that wasn't really our mission in North Vietnam. It was to take away the infrastructure. The first mission I flew on was the Paul Doomer Bridge, which went north out of Hanoi across the Red River. And that was the first mission on which we used laser-guided bombs, so very highly controlled, accurate bombs that we dropped. And the one span of the bridge was dropped into the Red River, so mission accomplished. Were you doing anything to, uh, like any coordination with the Marines and the, the Army on the ground? Yes, yeah. We flew uh, close air support missions for Army uh, specifically. We used to fly, uh, if there were troops in contact near the uh, demilitarized zone, they would call us in uh, and there would be a forward air controller in the air mm -hmm. who would shoot a rocket at the target, a smoke, a smoke rocket which would smoke the target and then we would come in and drop our bombs to protect some of the, uh, the Army guys down on the ground. We also did night missions along the Ho Chi Minh Trail because uh, the North Vietnamese were supplying their troops in the south and bringing stuff in through Laos along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we did a lot of work on the Ho Chi Minh Trail at night, going after tankers and you know trucks bringing supplies in. Uh, there were a number, number of different missions. Do you remember any specific close air support? Those seem that they'd be dangerous. You've got to go fly low, right? No, we weren't that low. But uh, I do remember one night, I was leading a mission, and there were two of us on the mission. And the forward air controller called us in to a target on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He said there's a, an ammo dump or a truck park that I found. So I went in and dropped my bombs, uh, and <clears throat> they exploded. I didn't see much, but my wingman went in and dropped his in a different spot, and we saw secondary explosions for about 10 minutes, uh, about a square mile. He hit exactly on the ammo and fuel dump, and as we were flying out, 
we saw things blowing up for like 10 minutes. It was just amazing what happened. I mean, I'm sure we wiped out this, a month's worth of supplies that they had destined for South Vietnam. It was just luck because it was nighttime. But it was kind of amazing, the, the explosions that kept happening. And it was his bombs that, uh, that hit. But that was uh, a very exciting night. So we had a few like that with... Uh, because we were pretty good bombers in the Air Force. We, we could put bombs on, on targets uh, with great facility. Did, did it feel any different? Like, was there a high sense of urgency when you knew that there were guys on the ground that needed your help? Oh, yeah. You always feel, you know, that brotherhood. You always feel as though you got to be extra specially accurate mm -hmm. and on target for guys like that. And I had one mission on the Quabiet River which ran out of the DMZ. And there were some North, uh, South Vietnamese regulars who were pinned down. And my bombs hit right on top of the uh, strong point that was holding them down. And the, and the forward air controller, he said to me, all these guys are jumping up and down on the ground screaming and yelling because you saved their lives. I said, that's great. I feel good about that. But... Uh, yeah, we, we had, uh, uh, you get a lot of satisfaction out of a mission that's accomplished the right way, so. And uh, so, it was good, felt good to do that stuff, to help people. But they were shooting at us too, you know? So, it went both ways. Yeah, tell me about some more missions. So, you know, we were flying missions, uh, in October and November of 1972, we were flying every other day in and off Vietnam. So it was pretty intense. I mean, it starts to weigh you down after a while, you know, because uh, psychologically it's very stressful. But we had on one day, we had four guys shot down. And, uh, you know, that's not... That, that's a, a very traumatic experience for the squadron because you, these, are your, these are your brothers. You know? So we had four guys shot down. And we didn't know if they were POWs, if they had been captured, or if they died when they got shot down. So we, we hoped they, had been, they were captured. But we had a party that night at our hooch on the base in Thailand. Everybody got together, we're singing songs. It's probably the best party that I've ever been to. We're drinking, we're having fun, but it was all emblematic of the camaraderie in that group because you're so close to these people and it brought everybody together dramatically and with the hope that they made it. But it was wild, I'll tell you. And it's just, it's typical of people in that uh category and in that frame of mind in combat that people who haven't experienced that wouldn't understand but it was a wonderful bonding experience so uh, but in total we had eight people shot down what's it like coming back from a mission where someone didn't come back well you condition yourself you know you condition yourself to be ready for that you know you know it could happen I mean, they were shooting planes down almost every day in that period. And you can, you condition for it, so you're ready. And, you, you know, it, it doesn't bother you. You just have to go up the next day. You get up, brief the next day, and go up. So if anything, it just incited us to want to fight harder. And uh, didn't create any fear in people's minds. I mean, you know, you're always apprehensive when you're going into a target area like that. But... Uh, you know, it really, it was a bonding experience, really. And, and we kind of assumed they had been captured. We didn't know for sure. But uh, in that experience, I was the only pilot from the Navy flying in uh, Vietnam at that time. And they were talking about repatriating the POW. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple of POW stories. So my commanding officer came to me one day, because I was the only Navy guy on the Air Force base. And he said, you know, if these prisoners are released while we're still here, 
you know, we left in December of 72. He said, if these prisoners are released before we leave, uh, we want you to be the Air Force's Navy liaison to go to Hanoi to greet these people when they're released. And I thought, what a phenomenal opportunity that would be. Now, it didn't happen because they weren't released until March of the next year. But I often thought about how, how great that would have been to be up there. Because I knew a lot of guys who were POWs. And to meet these guys and greet them as they were released after three years or six years or six months. But, the, you know, I, uh, we left before that happened. But when we got back to our base in North Carolina, uh, you know, we were flying training missions or whatever. And in March of 1973, we got back in December of 72. But in March of 1973, uh, they signed the peace accords and they released all of the remaining POWs. And I think there were 600 plus POWs being kept up at the Hanoi Hilton. So we really didn't know what the status was of our eight people from our base, right, in North Carolina. So the night that they were gonna release the names, there was a list of names that was gonna be sent to our command post once they had all the POWs identified who were being released. And we were at a guy's house on the base at a party. And everybody was having a great time, right? But we didn't know the status of these eight guys. So the host of the party was at the command post on base waiting for the list to come in, all right? So we were waiting for him to come back to the house to let us know. So all of a sudden we hear these wheels screeching as he comes around the corner and then he jams his brakes on in front of his house. And there are like a hundred people in his house, all drinking and partying. He ran up the stairs, he slammed open the screen door and he yelled out as loud as he could, they're all alive. And everybody started to cry. Every, I didn't cry. I don't know why. I was too drunk, maybe. Everybody in that house started to cry. These tough, grizzled, hardcore combat veterans. It was such an emotional experience, but they all came back. Everybody came back. And it's, it's the first time we knew that they were all alive. So it was kind of a follow-on to that party we had that night, the bonding party. It was fabulous. Then they all came back. Uh, two of them were hurt during the ejections. One guy hurt his arm, but uh, everybody was in pretty good health. But they weren't treated very well. You know, they were, there was some torture and, you know, there wasn't so much torture, but mistreatment of POWs. But uh, the North Vietnamese were using them as a bargaining chip for the peace talks because they knew we wanted these guys back. But that was, a, that was an incredible experience that night. That was really something, you know. They're all alive, and everybody started. And instantly, everybody started to cry. I'm going to cry right now. Oh, it's unbelievable. No, really, I get goosebumps telling these stories. I mean, it's just... But it's one of these experiences in life you go through, you know, the, where I consider myself very fortunate to have been exposed to that stuff. Because you start to realize what's important in life, you know. Like for me, not much really bothers me, you know, because nobody's shooting at me. I mean, what the heck? It's no big deal. I had a mission. I had a mission. We used to go to a place called Bat Lake in the southern part of North Vietnam. And Bat Lake was, there was a, there was a, a, a ford that went across the lake where the North Vietnamese would send trucks with ammunition and troops and whatever. And uh, we used to have to go in regularly to bomb that Ford, to blow it up so they couldn't get the trucks across. Mm -hmm. So we went on a mission there one time, and there was a low overcast. We had to come in under the clouds at about 7,000 feet and then roll in to drop our laser-guided bombs on the target. And as we were approaching the target, the, the, the forward air controller, who was in another airplane, he said to us, okay, we're gonna mark the target for you with smoke, but just be careful, because they have a nine level gunner down there, all right? Now nine level, 10 is the best. Nine level gunner is a pretty good gunner. 
So we rolled in, and I was leading the flight, and uh, I rolled in, and there were bullets going over my wings as I was going into the target. And these 100 millimeter shells, and only every fifth one is a tracer where you can see the, the glow. So, you know, between every tracer and they, they were going over this wing like this, woo, woo, woo. So I'm rolling in. That gets your attention, by the way, when the bullets are coming by like that. But you're almost gritting your teeth, like thinking one of these is going to hit you. Nah, you know, they were pretty close, but you're not thinking about that. You're trying to think about getting the bombs on target. But yeah, you're thinking I could get killed up here, you know? That's what you think. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so we always had AAA. We always had traces going by on almost every mission. But uh, they they weren't, you know, we had ways of evading that stuff. But when you're in a bombing run, uh, and I, I had one at night uh, where the bullets were going by, the traces were going by, that, that got my attention that night because you're right in the middle of the, you're flying to drop bombs on the guy shooting at you. And you got the bullets going well like this, you know. So. I mean, you think too because he's he's right in you're right in his. You're flying right down the chute. You're flying right into where he's shooting from. So you're kind of dueling with the enemy a little bit, you know. We're trying to get him, and he's trying to get us. Yeah. I guess you see the bombs go off. You know who won the. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! You can tell. Yeah, but uh, you know, people who there were a lot of protesters about Vietnam. A lot of protests in the U.S., and they were mainly from people who did not want to go to Vietnam, and I don't blame them, but they, they wanted the war to end. And there were others who thought it was just unfair for us, a power like ours, to be fighting these poor North Vietnamese people. But they were very tough and very strong and determined not to lose. And uh, But my mindset was, you know, you have a communist country in North Vietnam, trying to take over a democratic country in South Vietnam. So our mission was to prevent the spread of communism. And they were shooting at us just like we were shooting at them. It wasn't us imposing anything on them. We were, we were in as much danger as they were. Yeah. So it was just a, <clears throat> a give and take of that sort. But uh, so we thought we were doing the right things, and I think we were. And uh, now we do business with the North Vietnamese, and we're, you know, we're friendly now. But I think that war had something to do with stemming the spread of communism. You know, people got the sense that we weren't going to just back off. Well, you were, if this was late in the war as well, right? So the yeah, this was the, the war ended in, I think, March of, February of 73. So we were there just before the war ended. I mean, so this, I mean, the, talk about the climate at home, right? I mean, the anti-war movement was in full force. Mm -hmm. The two was about the bombing. Yeah, exactly. Did this affect, I mean, did you guys think about this stuff no. at all? No, we weren't. I didn't get any sense or any, there was no harassment of, about being there. In fact, everybody thought it was great, you know, that I was a war hero, which is not really what I was. But, but when I was flying missions, Jane Fonda uh, went to North Vietnam when I was there, and we were going into Hanoi like almost every day. And uh, she was manning one of the guns. You know, they put her in the seat of one of the anti-aircraft guns. So that day we didn't fly missions. We could not fly missions while she was there because we might have killed her, you know. But I never appreciated her. I, I understand why she would want to do something like that. But she had a skewed sense of what was right and what was wrong, in my opinion. And uh, she, uh, one of the POWs gave her a note, apparently. I, I've heard this is hearsay, but one of the guys down there gave her a note when she was walking around talking to them and uh, put it in her hand with the thought that she might bring it home give it to his wife and she turned the she turned the note over to the North Vietnamese captors and they punished and tortured the guy who gave it to her that was that was all because of her now that's that's hearsay but i think that's pretty accurate so you know uh i can understand why people get intensely opposed to combat and 
and killing people. But the killing was going both ways. I mean, a lot hmm? of people have said that the, I mean, you know, McNamara, the kind of the elites, right? A lot of them said that the war was unwinnable early on in the war. Of course, a lot of that stuff didn't come out till after. But well, it wasn't. It was not. It was not unwinnable. From a military capability standpoint, we could have won it in a week. It was the political uh, impediments that were put in our way about what we could do militarily. And when when uh, when we started bombing North Vietnam in 1972, and we stopped in November of 72 to go into the peace talks again. <clears throat> And those peace talks broke down again because the North Vietnamese wouldn't acquiesce. Then Richard Nixon sent in B-52s to bomb Hanoi. Now, a B-52 will carry about 80 500-pound bombs. And they would send in three of those B-52s every hour, all day long, day and night. And that brought the North Vietnamese to their knees. And we could have done that at the beginning of the war and they would have given up. So it was, and we didn't win the, the war. Nobody really won. I mean, it was just, a, it was just an absolute abomination. But the, the politicians were so fearful of irritating the Chinese, of doing something, blowing up a Russian ship, mm. that they, they never pulled out all the stops. But we could have done that early in the war and just ended the whole thing. But it would have been a, a, a horrible, you know, uh, end result from a standpoint of pe people be being killed. But look at all the people who were killed anyway. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was winnable militarily, but not politically. But we get out of it, and I think we learned a lesson about getting involved in these things. And uh, so, uh, but now we're all friendly. We all do business with uh, each other. So. Any other specific missions that you think people would like to know about? Uh, we had a guy one time who came off target and he got a little nervous and he pulled the trigger and shot a missile at his own airplanes, at his own friends. It went right between them. <laughs> he had his finger on the trigger. So he made a mistake. But uh, no, the missions were about the same every day, you know. You'd get uh, hyped up, you'd get the adrenaline flowing, and uh, you know, you'd hope, you'd hope that you would hit the target and accomplish the mission, and you know, we worked very hard at that. And uh, we'd go back to the tanker and get back to the officers club and watch a Thai boxing match and play billiards. Did you, I mean, I guess you were with, there was always something happening, right? So do you think that maybe distracted you? a little bit from potentially dying or some No, I, I, you know, that, that thought of dying never crossed my mind, really. Uh, I knew I wouldn't get killed. And, uh, and not, not many pilots get killed by a MiG or a SAM. I told you this one story about the guy the night before I got to Thailand. But your airplane would be damaged uh, badly, but we were pretty well protected in the cockpit. Uh, you know, you, you, there was a risk of the plane blowing up, but we, I had a lot of confidence in my abilities to evade enemy airplanes and SAMs, and others there had the same feeling. So there wasn't much of a sense that someone was going to get killed. But it was always lingering there, but you don't think about those things. You know, we have to be optimistic and you assume it's somebody else is going to get it, not you. So really, you get yourself, and when I got off the plane, by the way, when, when I told you the story about the, uh, the planes coming back from the mission, we used to call those missions specials, all right, a special. There's nothing special about them, by the way. But uh, after my commanding officer said to me, yeah, those are the MiGs. Those are MiGs. The planes all landed, and he said to me, you know, you get yourself into a frame of mind here, okay? Will you assume it's dangerous, you might not make it, but you're going to get back. 
And if you can't get yourself into that frame of mind where you don't care, then you're not going to make it, all right? You have to believe that you're superhuman and you're going to be fine, which is the way I felt anyway. But we had two guys. Uh, I was walking up to uh, base operations one day. Now, I had not flown any missions yet. And one of my friends was walking back from the tower. He was on uh, uh, duty at the tower. And he passed me on the road. And I said, Doug, how you doing? He didn't say anything to me. He was a good friend of mine. He didn't say anything. I said, that was strange. And he had not flown any missions yet. All right. But the, the, the threat was terrifying to a lot of people, you know. And no one knew what to expect when we went, when we went to Hanoi. But so I found out that this guy, Doug, had been on duty at the tower. And he was sitting there, and the guy with him said he just took the, he had a truck he was driving, took the truck keys, he threw them up in the air, he got up and walked out, went downstairs, passed me, he checked himself into the hospital. He had a nervous breakdown. And it was the end of his flying career. And he hadn't even flown a mission yet, right? I said, that's unbelievable, this poor guy. And it was the end of his career. We had another guy who was in the back seat who went on a couple of these missions to Hanoi. And he came back and he claimed that he had fainted in the back seat. And if you faint in the back seat, you can't fly any more missions. So they took him out of the airplane and sent him home. They wouldn't let him fly. And then we had another guy. There, there were three or four people who had problems. We had one guy. You had to stay in tight formation when you were flying in the, in the threat area because we had uh, countermeasures, equipment, and if you didn't stay together, like within 500 feet of each other, then your airplane would be highlighted for a SAM. So this one guy just couldn't stay in formation. He was just too nervous to stay in formation. So he kept. He was scared, you know. He was, he was well, and I don't blame him, right? He was. He was. He was just too apprehensive, and he couldn't maintain formation. And no one would fly with him in the back seat. The back seat said, I'm, "We're not going to go with this guy, because he's highlighting his airplane. He's allowing his airplane to be highlighted by these SAM sites by being out of formation. So no one would fly with him. So they had to send him home." So we had, we had three or four situations like that where people just had uh, mental disruption or, you know, issues, which is, makes sense. You know, you can't blame them. And I remember my first mission to Hanoi was this, uh, was this mission to bomb the Paul Doomer Bridge. So we had to join on a tanker as soon as we took off. And this is one of my first combat missions. You know, I had flown in peacetime for four years. But I had a little trouble getting on the tanker myself because I was a little bit apprehensive too. I, I got on it. It wasn't a problem. But, but everybody has a little bit of a trepidation in those situations. But I do remember that mission. It was a Sunday morning. We were flying in. We were the chaff flight that day. So we were dropping the chaff. So we were the first ones in to the target area. And we flew over Hanoi. And I looked down at Hanoi. And it's a little burg. It's a little city like the size of Medfield. Like this. With a couple of tall buildings. But there's nothing there on the Red River. And the bridge was leading out to the north. This is in 1972. And my first thought was... You mean we've fought for eight years for that little place? We could have blown that place up in one day. We could have wiped out Hanoi, which they did at the end of the war, by the way, with the B-52s. I couldn't believe it. I said, that's what we've been fighting for for all these years? That little teeny place down there? It was, it was overwhelming, I thought, because it was nothing. It was maybe a mile across. That was about it. And... Uh, then the guys went in and dropped the bomb on the bridge, and the span went right down in the river. But, uh, yeah, there was no resistance that day. I mean, it was, it was just, maybe they were all in church, I don't know. <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't that a, a intense a mission, that, that first mission. So. Any, uh, any funny stories? 
Well, I told you the story about the Dr. Pepper yeah. guy, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it was funny with me because every time I loaded the gun, they would like jump out of the van when I was putting the bullets in my gun. But no, there, there weren't, you know, when you're flying, th these are all very professional, uh, highly trained people. So there was no, there wasn't much levity up there uh, when you're flying missions, but we had a lot of fun back at the officers club, partying and playing pool and watching Thai boxing matches. So, but it was just, it was just a great bunch of guys and we just had a great time, you know? But uh, most people never can never experience something like that. They just don't get a chance to be in that intense an environment where the relationships are so close. So, uh, but yeah, there was there were some things. I, I had a uh, my <laughs> the Phantom was a supersonic airplane. So we came off of a target one time, in uh, this was in South Vietnam. And uh, my leader, his his call sign was Snowball because he was bald as a, as a cue ball, so we called him Snowball. So he was out in front of us coming back from the time. We had some extra fuel. So I decided that I was going to do a supersonic pass under his airplane and sneak up behind him because he didn't know where I was. So I came, I got up to Mach, about Mach 1.2, just over the speed of sound, and I went under his airplane like this. And when you go, on, when you go by somebody, the sonic wave hits them. Mm -hmm. It's like a big jolt. So, so I went under his airplane, and I pulled up in front of him. So the, the sonic jolt hit him, and then I pulled up in front, and he went through my jet wash. So he got two blasts. And I was laughing. I was laughing so hard. So I pulled up and got back into formation on his wing. And he went like this. He called me over like this. He said, come over here. <laughs> You're going to get it when we get back. He said. <laughs> it's like uh, when they buzz the tower. The Same the thing. Yeah, I flew, I flew right under his plane. Bo I, that's called booming somebody. I boomed him, and then I pulled right up in front of him. So, <laughs> you know, you do those crazy things. But, uh, you know, we had fun. You had to make some fun out of the whole thing. experiences that you'd like to share? You know, I would have to think about, uh, I can tell you what, it was great coming home. When we got on the airplane to come home, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful experience to get on the C-141 to fly. It was 25 hours mm. in the airplane, the best 25 hours I've ever spent. Because you realize, just you relax after that. You know, I told you about how you get into the frame of mind. Mm -hmm. So you stay at that level of uh you know intensity mentally for you know we were there for six months and then you relax when you get on the airplane and you realize that we're actually going home but they say there are no atheists in foxholes no true words have ever been spoken i mean i would go before one of these special missions to hanoi i would be in church you know i'm, I'm a catholic so i would be at mass and communion, and we'd be saying my prayers, Lord, if you get me through this one tomorrow, you know, I'm never gonna miss Mass again, ever. And uh, I was not the only guy in church, by the way, okay? The church was pretty packed with pilots. And I just don't miss Mass now, because God got me through it, and I believe he did, and uh, I'll do whatever I have to do to get to church on Sunday. Yeah, before before I went through this, I, I really wasn't that good at going to church. But yeah, it changed my philosophy. Have you been to the Vietnam Memorial? I was just thinking about that. It's interesting you would ask that question. So I had uh, some friends who were killed, many who were wounded in Vietnam. But that Vietnam Memorial is a very, very impressive edifice. I mean, when you see, I think there were 57,000 plus people killed. Uh, I went once with a friend of mine uh, who had been on the ground in Vietnam in case, at Khe Sanh. And there were a lot of people 
walking and looking at that memorial, and no one was saying a word. I mean, very, very quiet, somber, respectful, reverent group. But it really makes an impression on you when you realize how many lives were lost in that wall. Any other um, missions or stories you'd like to share? Well... I can tell you one that's maybe a little bit off color. Do you want to hear stories like that? You might have to cut this out, but it's not off color really. But we had, uh, these are long missions. So you might have to, you know, relieve yourself on one of these missions because your bladder would fill up from all the water we were drinking. So we used to carry what we call piddle packs, which is a little plastic bag with a sponge in it. And if you had to, urinate, you would tell the guy there was a stick in the back seat, and these guys weren't pilots in the back seat, but they could, they could fly the airplane a little bit. So if the pilot had to relieve himself, he would say to the guy in the back seat, why don't you fly the airplane for a couple of minutes while I do this, all right? You take out the piddle pack and urinate at it, right? While the guy in the back seat was flying the airplane. So one time, these two guys, the guy in the back seat thought he, was, thought he was a comedian, right? So the pilot is filling the piddle pack with his urine, and the guy in the back seat pushed the stick forward, right? So he had zero Gs on the airplane. And the piddle pack, all the urine in the piddle pack started floating up into the cockpit, right? Little droplets floating around in the cockpit because he's at zero G. And once that happened, the guy in the front seat, I can't tell you the language he was using because he's trying to catch the drop. <laughs> and then the guy in the back seat pulls back on the stick and puts two Gs on the airplane and all these droplets come right down to the guy's lap, all over his lap. <laughs> Believe me, he wasn't happy. So he pushed it forward and then pulled it back. Boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of laughs that night. Oh, man. oh my God, that was funny. <laughs> he was soaking wet when he got back. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, we had some crazy people. Well, I'll tell you a great story. Uh, like I said, the difference, major difference between men and boys is the cost of their toys. So the excitement and the pleasure and the adrenaline rush of flying a high performance jet is uh, pretty incredible, really. It's the, the feeling of power is awesome. But the Phantom, I'll tell you a story, the Phantom was a Mach 2.2 airplane. So that's about close to 1,600 miles an hour, all right? Now, we never had to go that fast. There was no need to go Mach 2. So I had flown the plane for about maybe three years, and the fastest I had gone was about Mach 1.6 or 1.7, which is pretty, that's about 1,000 miles an hour. So I was on a test flight one day. They had changed one of the engines, so you have to run the engine up and really exercise it to be sure it's working right. So, but I had to get up to about Mach 1.7 just to test some of the devices on the airplane at high speed. So I said to the guy in the back seat, I said, we're going to make a Mach 2 run today. Because I had never been Mach 2. So in order to get to Mach 2 in a Phantom, you have to go to full afterburner, which is very, very, that's... That's 36 pounds and 1,000 pounds of thrust pushing this airplane along. You have to do zero-G maneuvers to take the parasite drag off the airplane. It kind of lets it accelerate. So you have to do three or four of these zero-G maneuvers. But I got up to Mach 2.05, just over Mach 2. I was at about 50,000 feet over the ocean. And I really, you, could, you can't tell much at that altitude. But I looked down at the the odometer in the airplane, and you know how your tense indicator is moving when you're going about 100 miles an hour in a car? Well, that's how fast my miles indicator was going. And this is what I looked at. I looked down and I saw these things going, one, 
two, three. <laughs> I was going a mile every two and a half seconds. Wow. If someone had shot a bullet at me, a high, high velocity bullet from behind, I just would have outrun it because it couldn't have caught me. So I was going about probably about 1,600 miles an hour. I made a turn because you burn a lot of fuel at this speed. Uh, so I made a turn. The tightest turn I could make was an 11 mile radius turn. Okay. And I went back to the base and landed. I said, hey, I, I did my Mach 2 run. So McDonald Douglas, McDonald Douglas sent me a little pin that says Mach 2 Club. <laughs> but there are many people who traveled Mach 2 because a lot of the airplanes just won't go that fast because yeah. they tune down the engines and they, the planes are a little bent. Yeah. But so. Uh, what does it feel like being up at 50,000 feet? I mean, you must be able to see space, basically. You can see the curvature of the Earth, not at 50,000, but, it, you know, I went up, I hit 70,000 one time when I pulled the nose up by mistake. I shouldn't have pulled it up. But I got up to about 70. You can see a little bit of the curvature of the Earth when you're at that altitude. Uh, you know? Gives you more faith in the fact that there's a creator, because this stuff didn't just happen automatically. But, you know, you get a sense there's something bigger than us out there but it was it's really uh it's a thrill and a privilege to be able to do that stuff I mean, a lot, I, a lot and to get paid for it yeah a lot of the astronauts i mean said similar type. oh yeah yeah the experience is is uh is uh, you know surreal when you get up at those levels and uh it's very cool cool stuff but it it, it makes life it gives you a different perspective on life to go through these experiences. But it's not just pilots that go through it, you know. How does it change your perspective? Well, you realize that, that one, it, it helps you understand what human beings can do, what they can create in the way of machinery and the technology stuff we can do and, and the power we can generate just because human beings keep striving I mean, eventually we'll put someone on Mars. Elon Musk could people out, put people on Mars now. He's got about 2,000 people that are willing to go. And they know they can't get back. So, you know. But it just gives you a different sense. You experience things that most people never have a chance to experience. You know. And I just kind of backed into it, you know. Thank God that guy told me the story on the beach that day at the day camp. But it does, it changes your, your philosophy a little bit about uh, how lucky we are to be in America with the great power and intellect and wealth we have here and the wonderful people. We kind of control the whole world. But uh, so we're very fortunate. But I feel very fortunate to have gone through that sort of training and, and had the privilege of doing that sort of thing when you think about it. I mean, the military, I spent 21 years. It's one of the best experiences I've had other than having my four children born, being at the birth of my four kids. So, pretty cool stuff. Anything else you'd like to talk through that we haven't covered? We've covered just about everything, right. you know, but that was great.